Welcome, Happy New Year. Welcome to our first workshop of the year. Um, I know there's other things on uh, folks' personal agendas this afternoon, so uh, let's go get, ahead and get started. Uh, Mr. Administrator, item number one, House Bill 735. House Bill 735, there's been a lot of questions regarding what that impact is and uh, the steps that we're taking to uh, try to comply with that new legislation. So I'm going to ask Michelle Krikovich to come up. She's the Director of Contractor Licensing. But while she's coming up, I also wanted to um, announce that we have made some operational changes and improvements. So we're combining uh, contractor licensing over with BDRS. And so Michelle's serving a dual role. She's going to continue in her role as Director of Contractor Licensing, but she's also going to be the Deputy Director of BDRS, which really goes to, you know, if you know her background, her background was in process improvement. And so it fits very well with some of the operational changes that we're looking at fresh eyes and the way we do permitting um, and the way things flow. If you also remember back, we have outsourced the um, inspection function of contractor licensing over uh, to um, 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 code, enforcement. code enforcement, our code enforcement group, trying to gain efficiencies in our field staff versus in-house because we had four people there, but they're running all over the county. And if we combine that with people that are already out in the field, then it, it allows us for greater efficiency in the way we uh, actually do the work. Trying to reduce windshield time and gain efficiency by uh, coverage areas. So there's a, several operational improvements that we're looking forward to. And we're happy to have um, Michelle you know, uh, helping us out with those. Um, but she's here today to talk specifically about House Bill 735 and I'm gonna ask her to outline those, outline the steps that we're taking to try to comply and some of the difficulties in doing so. So go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Barry. And good morning, everyone. Um, I thought probably the first place to start is really to let you know, remind you or introduce you to what the contractor licensing department is and does. Um, as a department, we oversee the licensing administration, uh, records management, and um, investigations of the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board. So what we do is we license contractors to ensure that those who are working in the trade have the skills to be able to perform the work. We monitor their insurance to ensure that um, both Homeowners, citizens are protected when they hire a contractor, but also that workers are protected when they're on the job. Um, we also um, enforce the Florida and county statutes and ordinances um, specifically related to unlicensed contracting, as well as also arbitrating building code disputes, amending building codes, and protecting the coastal construction control line. So there is a governance aspect to what we do. Um, ultimately, we enforce construction licensing law. We are a countywide authority, and we have been protecting citizens in Pinellas County since 1973. That's when the PCCLB was originally um, created. And um, as I have been able to dive in deeper to our business, I have learned from some of our old timers, including second and sometimes third generation contractors in Pinellas County, that what um, inspired the contractor licensing, to, um, uh, the PCCLB way back in 1973 was that Pinellas County was uh, going through a time of great development. Now we are in a time of great redevelopment, but in 1973, we were very attractive for all contractors who were coming in, who, some who did not have the skills to deliver the work, some who were bad actors who took the money, ran off, didn't finish the work, and um, some citizens who were harmed. So I think one of the things to take away from this is that we are a professional licensing board. We're responsible for maintaining standards and ensuring that contractors live up to those standards and then sanctioning them if they don't meet those standards. Um, we're now entering our 50th year. So licensing in Pinellas County is not something that's new. Um, we currently have 18 specialty license classifications. There are 41 
classifications that are dictated by the state, and 18 local specialties. Uh, those, among those 18 specialties are approximately 1,400 licensed contractors who are in a variety of state of, uh, I'm sorry, um, locally um, dictated trades. And each of them, every contractor who comes to us for licensing has to go through a, a rigorous um, process to get their license. They have to have the um, prerequisite construction experience. It must be verified. And in a case of some specialties, it can be as little as one year of experience. In other specialties, like a plumber, that requires eight years of work in the field before you even qualify for to sit for the examination. Um, every applicant must provide a background and credit history. Um, they have to pay for, study for, and pass their trade examination plus a business law exam. exam. Um, and I have actually been in examination review meetings, um, in particular where we've invited some applicants to come in for an interview with our exam committee. I have seen grown men cry when the, the exam committee has approved their application for licensure because it represents such an opportunity and hope and, you know, it's, a, it's a, um, the chance for them to work for themselves. Um, in many cases, you know, some of the, the applicants have not finished high school. Um, and this represents opportunity. And I'm al always reminding our, t our staff that we're not processing licenses. We are offering hope and opportunity for entrepreneurs. Um, the earliest licensed specialty contractor that who was affected by House Bill 735 was licensed in 1982. So he has been practicing in the field, in the trade, in Pinellas County for 39 years. And the most recent was licensed last month. So you get an idea of you know, the, the range of experience. Um, and all of these contractors are working compliant with construction licensing law. These 1,400 contractors represent about 11% of the total field of contractors that we license. So we license about 14,000. Um, it's just over 14,000 and these 1,400, which if you do the math is 10%, but it's actually 10.6 when you look at the absolute numbers. So what about House Bill 735? I did have the opportunity to sit with Commissioner Eggers and to give him a deep dive, so thank you for inspiring this opportunity to be able to speak about it at a higher level, too. Um, House Bill 735 was signed into law last June, and it, in effect, eliminates all local specialty licensing effective July 1st, 2023. And the rights that were granted to the PCCLB to licensed contractors are granted under the Special Act, which we refer to as 75489 under the laws of Florida. Um, that is a state statute that gives us in Pinellas County the authority to issue these local licenses. Um, then House Bill 735 basically contradicts those rights um, and supersedes those rights and has eliminated our ability to license those specialty contractors. But it is also the special act that gives us our authority and, and duty and requirement for, because we are countywide, for all municipal building departments, including Pinellas County Building Services and St. Pete Beach Building Department, it requires them to confirm the license status of any contractor before they issue a building permit. And that is also a state statute, and it is reiterated in the, under the special act. So what that means is that there is a, there is a direct relationship between when a building permit is required for construction and the licensed contractor who can perform that work. And one of the 
challenges that we have identified and we identified prior to the adoption of this bill. We've been screaming out to the masses, anybody who will listen, that here's one of the impacts, perhaps an unintended consequence of House Bill 735, is that contractors who have been performing their trade in Pinellas County have been compliant with their license go to the building departments, do the proper thing by getting their permits. As soon as we eliminate their license, those contractors will no longer be allowed to pull those building permits. And you might remember when we were here for our budget meeting, I had told you the story about our pile driving um, experience where we had recommended as a department to our PCCLB board to, we were looking to eliminate some local licenses on our own, doing an a, a internal evaluation. We recommended to the board that we eliminate the pile driving license because pile driving can be done by a general contractor or a marine specialty contractor. And so, you know, there were very few contractors who were impacted by this. We made that re recommendation and the board accepted it. And in November of last, the, the year prior, uh, 2020, um, the board confirmed the elimination of the pile driving classification. We let the contractor know that he no longer had to require a license in that field. And three months later, he went to pull a permit at the building department in Pinellas County. But they declined to issue that building permit to him because the work was not did not qualify under his marine specialty contractor's license, which would allow him to, to build piles out on the water, but he did not have the general contractor's license to be able to do piles on land. It was his pile driving license that allowed him to do this work on land. He had been doing it for 25 years. Our well-intentioned um, decision to eliminate that classification had an unintended consequence by prohibiting him from doing the work that he had been able to do. That's when all the light, you know, the lightning struck and the bells were ringing and going, okay, here's the real impact of this proposed legislation. And I had the, the privilege of working very closely with Brian Lowack as we tried to um, you know, let all of the influencers know what the impact would be. Um, the one thing that the House Bill 735 does do is it confirms our continuing right to license journeymen, uh, which are apprentice licenses. And um, it did eliminate one classification, but there were zero contractors who were impacted by that. Um, it does have a financial impact on the department because now House Bill 735 is dictating the level of fees that we can charge for journeyman applications. Um, and so our current fee has been $75. It's been that for as long as I've been associated with the department for four years. Um, but now it, under House Bill 735, effective July 1st, 2023, that will be a maximum of $25. So. Um, there is some impact, financial impact on the journeyman side. Uh, but with the um, elimination of these 18 specialty licenses, there, as I said, there are about 1,400 contractors who are impacted. Um, some of the classifications that are impacted will have no effect or, you know, those contractors will still be able to get up and, and continue their business the day after it goes into effect. Those would be painting contractors, tile and marble contractors, and cabinet specialty contractors. Um, in most cases, none of that work requires a building permit. So those contractors will still be able to continue their trade um, without, without impact. There is a specialty called the finished carpentry specialty, and a finished carpentry is just below the, the trade, um, the scope of work is just below that of a, of a carpentry specialty co uh, contractor. So a finished carpentry uh, specialist can do uh, molding and, um, and uh, flooring and 
um, do a lot of cabinetry work. Most of those things never require a permit. However, a finished carpentry specialist can do windows and doors currently, and that privilege will be eliminated by House Bill 735. The only um, trades that will be able to do windows and doors will be those that are licensed by the state. So there are finished carpentry specialists. Um, we have 247 of them. I cannot tell you how many of those do windows and doors, but if any of them do, their ability has just been eliminated. Um, the other thing that we have done to look at what the per, uh, potential impact is of this bill is I did a complete survey of all of the building departments across Pinellas County. Of course, Pinellas County Building Services is consolidated, oops, um, has consolidated and is performing building um, and permitting services for a number of the, the municipalities. But in effect, I found 17 um, different permitting agencies across the county. And among them, there is great inconsistency on what requires a permit and what does not. For example, to build a fence in unincorporated Pinellas County, you do not need a building permit. But to build a fence in Clearwater, you do. To do uh, drywall work in Pinellas County, you don't need a building permit until it reaches above a certain square footage. It's a, it's a high level. However, in St. Pete Beach, where you know much of the, um, uh, the territory is below sea level, they do require a building permit for drywall. So we have some inconsistencies where a contractor, my neighbor is a fencing contractor, he can continue building fences in unincorporated Pinellas County because it doesn't require a permit, but he can't build a fence in Clearwater after his local specialty has been eliminated. So there are other contractors as well that may be affected by this flat work masonry, uh, paving specialty contractors, plaster and stucco contractors. It depends on the nature of the work that they're doing and the jurisdiction in Pinellas County where they are doing that. Now one of the things that we are taking the initiative on is that um, the PCCLB will be in one of our strategic plan elements for 2022 is to um, host a series of round table discussions for all of the municipal building departments, any of those kind of an open door invitation where we can talk about some of these inconsistencies in permitting. We can talk about new technologies. We can talk about um, uh, other, other challenges that are faced across, um, ac across this common element. Um, so we have, um, proposed our very first um, roundtable discussion for the end of January, although I must confess, we might want to wait and put it the second week of February just to, so we can get through the COVID curve that we're on. Um, because it, for us to have the real impact, it should be an in-person meeting, right? So we can, we can really facilitate discussion about things like this. Um, but I also want you to know that I have, we. Uh, on the PCCLB board, there are four building officials, so they're part of my constant consultation group. And um, uh, I also, you know, surveyed across all of the building departments. So this is a, a role, the, the common element is that we have that countywide authority. So we're trying to, to foster some relations and um, and try to minimize the impact that this will have on, basically on entrepreneurs. Contractors are entrepreneurs. Now there are 78 contractors in four classifications that may be eligible to upgrade to the state specialty structure certification. And what that means is that there is a state class um, that does a lot of the same work that each of these specialties do 
um, but it also does more. Their scope of work is broader. So for example, we have a garage door specialty contractor. There is a life safety factor in installing, repairing garage doors, and it does require a permit. All of our garage door contractors may be eligible to upgrade to the state, it's called a specialty structure uh, contractor, um, but some of them may not be because it does require five years of locally licensed expertise in order to grandfather in. It also requires that you never have had any suspensions and I can't attest, you know, in, in, until we dive in individually who might not be eligible because of suspensions. Um, and there are other factors as well. That is for them to grandfather up to that classification. Others may be eligible to retest, you know, to take that examination, and, but they basically have to start from scratch. Um, so there is a little proviso here. It says not all contractors will qualify. Um, there are six specialties that do require permits, primarily because the work is structural or it is affected or impacted by wind load, and they will be prohibited from pulling permits anywhere in Pinellas County. Those are uh, car carpentry contractors, depending on the nature of the work that they are doing, Natural gas contractors, think about that for a second. We are eliminating the specialty that, you know, um, licenses natural gas contractors. Uh, Non-electrical sign contractors and the pile driving contractor, again, he's not gonna be able to pull permits to do the work he's been doing for over 25 years. My fear with him is that he may retire. So how do contractors, what will they do to, you know, to mitigate this? Um, unfortunately, we're gonna lose some contractors to retirement. Um, I wanna talk about, you know, some of the other um, uh, repercussions in one second. Um, there are eight specialties that are licensed by both the county and the state. Um, they are not part of the 14, but all of those eight specialties that we have been licensing, where we license them only locally, based on the authority given to us by the Special Act, those contractors will have to register with DBPR and become state certified contractors. Um, and again, they may be eligible. There are some that may not be eligible. Um, and then I mentioned about the one journeyman classification. So what we have um, come to is that there's, there's three levels of economic impact um, in and on Pinellas County as a result of House Bill 735. The first, and everybody thinks that this is the one that we're most concerned about, is that there is a revenue impact to the PCCLB. That is forecasted, when I was working with Brian Lowack, we forecasted it to be about a million dollars over three years. It's not unsubstantial, but that is not the biggest impact on um, contractors and on business in Pinellas County. The biggest impact is the 550 contractors will be prohibited from pulling building permits and they will lose the ability to work in their trade, the same trade that we have already licensed them to work in for however, anywhere from 39 to, to years to one month, those contractors will not be able to perform their work. And most of those specialty contractors are business owners and all of them are entrepreneurs. So what are contractors' options? Um, they can upgrade their skills. They can test up to the next level. Those that are eligible, we will assist them in grandfathering to the state classification. But that doesn't cover everybody. Um, another option for... Can you give them an example of that? So if you get a general contractor's license, can you do any of the subspecialty type? I mean, that's... Certainly. Certainly yeah, so. if, you know, there are three contractors that sit at the highest level. I always call them the big three. They are general contractor, building contractor, and residential contractor. Any contractor can always upgrade to that next level. The, the, and they go in kind of... Um, deceding order, 
the general contractor at the highest, residential contractor is the, the first entry point. But consider that you're a garage door specialty contractor. The skills and expertise and knowledge that you have and the testing that was done for you to get your garage door license versus what's required to know how to be a residential contractor to build multifamily, multi-story homes, there's a big gap there. So we don't know how many of those specialty contractors may be eligible or willing to invest to upgrade to that highest level. Um, now, some of them can, so I talked about some of those who can upgrade to the state specialty and the structural. So that garage door contractor, he may just have to expand, you know, a little greater knowledge um, to also know how to do um, aluminum siding as part of that structural license that's at the state level. But it is beyond the scope of, you know, their existing training. But it is an option. Upgrading skills for a contractor is always an option. Another option is that they can become a W-2 employee of an eligible contractor. So they could become an, a W-2 employee of a general contractor, a building contractor, a residential contractor in order to be qualified to continue doing that work. But these are entrepreneurs who are highly unlikely to want to become employees of someone else's construction business. Now they can also find a contractor Generally, again, it's one of those big three to qualify their business. That's what it's referred to in the trade as to qualify their business, which means that, that they work under the authority and supervision of one of the big three contractors. Um, and that is an option. But ultimately what that becomes is that the big three contractor is lending his license to the other person just to allow them to pull permits. There's unlikely to be that direct supervision requirement. And what it also means is that there's an extra level of profit taking, right? Because now you have to pay that GC, mm, let's say 100 bucks an incident or $700 a month or you know whatever the, the going price may be that is going to be passed on to consumers. So my fencing neighbor, he could find a residential contractor to qualify his business that would allow him to continue to pull permits everywhere in the county, but the GC really has just lent his license. Or somebody corrected me once when I said that, they said, you mean selling their license, right? Um, and of course, that will increase prices to consumers because anything that is going to increase the price to the contractor is going to be passed on to the consumer. And then, of course, the other risk is contractors could choose to work without a permit. And that is a violation of Florida licensing law. And one of the, the, the challenges, this is just my own personal struggle with this, is how do you cite a contractor for unlicensed contracting, for working without a permit, doing the work that he was licensed to do, he or she was licensed to do a month ago because the state took that license away. So there, that is another risk. Another risk too that is not up here is that um, uh, contractors may get out of the business and the one thing that we, if you've tried to get any work done in Pinellas County, we have a shortage of contractors, um, and we can't afford to lose any of these, especially the good guys, you know, the guys who have been compliant all along. Um, so how are we helping the contractors prepare for change? Well, we are um, providing resources, recommendations. Uh, you know, we have a, a communication strategy planned to reach out to all of the contractors to help those who are eligible to upgrade, to help those who are eligible to grandfather. Um, we also um, have to prepare for any of those who are uh, looking to become state certified. Um, we can provide affidavits of licensure. It says that, you know, it's a letter of good standing. This contractor has been licensed locally and licensed by examination and provide that background. Bless you. Um, 
So we'll be, you know, supporting contractors and their ability to become licensed in other ways. Um, of course, we'll be working with the municipalities to identify where and, and if any permitting inconsistencies can be eliminated. But the thing to remember is that building permits are a requirement of the Florida Building Code. So there is, you know, we have some room um, in order to uh, make it more consistent, but there are certain things that will always require a permit. And the last element is that um, we also propose waiting until July 1st, 2023, when the state mandate goes into effect, before we adopt these changes in Pinellas County. Um, we do not want to be the ones to eliminate a contractor's ability to, do, to work compliant in Pinellas County um, by implementing this earlier. So what I am hopeful for is that um, we would have your endorsement to wait, you know, make that our effective date. Um, because another option is a lot can happen at the state level between now and July 1st, 2023. Um, what, how will this impact our business? Of course, um, we're going to continue registering and licensing co um, contractors. However, it will be only in the state certified classifications from, from that day forward. We will continue monitoring contractors' insurance. Um, we will continue enforcing construction licensing laws. A lot of people, I've heard some, some terrible rumors that the PCCLB is going away as a result of House Bill 735. That is not the case at all. Um, our duty to protect the citizens will continue. It's just that our work is now limited to those 13,000 to 14,000 um, state licensed contractors. And we will continue to um, accept applications for contractors to become locally licensed in those state classifications as well, because that is a, a service that we provide. And we'll continue you know, doing our local hearings, uh, monitoring amendments to the Florida Building Code, and um, arbitrating any disputes. Um, we'll continue work as usual, um, so we're not, we're not going anywhere. Anything else? Uh, let's see. I think that's it. So thank you. Commissioner's question, Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, what are the other counties doing? Um, it's interesting that you ask that. Um, it was middle of November, I attended a conference of the Construction Licensing Officials Association of Florida, which represents um, uh, many counties across the state. Now, it was still during COVID time, so there was still, it was not a full representation of counties, um, but m the, the impact and how this has been interpreted, interpreted and how it's being applied is very different from county to county. So for example, Hillsborough County immediately eliminated all of the local specialty classifications. They, as soon as the, the, the law was signed, um, effective date July 1st, 2021, that was it, they eliminated them all. Now they're, they're, they don't have a special act that mm -hmm. provides that additional higher level of governance. Um, so I have not spoken with the Hillsborough officials, but I do know that that's the action that they have taken. Now, in other um, counties that I spoke with in at the CLOAF conference, uh, they're faced with the exact same challenges that we are. Um, some of them um, have decided to wait to July 1st, 2023. Some of them made changes to their local specialties uh, immediately, but the impact to contractors in all of those territories is exactly the same as the uh, projected impact for Pinellas County. Does that answer your question? Yes, to a certain degree. So um, let's use the Hillsborough as, as an example. So if they don't have the PCCLB like we do in the special act, then who, just the state then 
decides if they have workers' comp and they have liability insurance and the state checks for that or not? The state, the state does check for that when you make your initial license application. And um, that when you do your two-year renewal, they would also confirm that. But they're not checking you know, in the middle of your, your insurance year to make sure that your policy is still in effect. They're not checking when it expires, you know, outside of their cycle. Um, you're, you're just, you're, once you're licensed by the state, you're continued to be licensed by the state until, or unless or until your status is revoked or you don't renew. Now what Hillsborough did is not unlike what we are having to do, which is we published something on our website um, that was inspired by um, what Hillsborough had published as well. And that shows for each of the specialties, if a permit is required, what will be the minimum standard that is required from that point forward? Okay. So the example, um, let's say for somebody who's doing windows and doors, that you will have to be a um, residential uh, building or general contractor in order to pull a permit to do that work. So eliminated the specialty and now made the standard so much higher. So they, they published a list that is very similar to the list that we have currently published on our website as well. It says, if this, than that. If you were doing this and the work requires a permit, you will now be required to be either this, that, or the other. Okay. Does this affect um, the coastal construction? No, it does not. It okay. does not at all. But that's within our special act that gave us the ability to keep it where it was and to govern it. And I know that was a big deal to all of the beaches. Absolutely. Yeah, it is not impacted by that. And our role as the custodian of that will continue. Okay. Because the other option I was thinking about was, well, maybe we should just get out of the business. <laughs> well, um, here's the thing is that... Because it's um, going to start costing us money from the general fund, I, I would predict. How would that... I don't well, see a correlation with that. Well, no, back well, to your fees. you're going to lose a million fees, dollars over three years. To your fees, that is something we have to look at. And so for, you know, general audience, um, this is a self-supporting group, mm -hmm. you know? So they they live by the fees that they charge. It's like the building department. Um, you know, the cost of the service is borne by the fees. Um, so that's something that we have to look at. Um, we we have only done... 11, it's only 11%, but right. go ahead. We have done models um, to forecast. And yes, a million dollars over three years is, is substantial, uh, but it is not our primary source of revenue. We receive, we earn our revenues from three sources. And as Barry said, we're, I call us an eat what you kill department. We earn revenues from licensing, the majority of those being state licensed contractors, right? We, they have to register with us. Um, the second is that we earn revenues from uh, citations that are issued for unlicensed contracting. That is a significant part of what we do is the enforcement and compliance part of enforcing construction licensing law. And the third aspect that we, um, where we receive our revenues is from issuing expired permit violations on behalf of building departments. So a contractor um, allows, he doesn't close out his building permit in a timely manner, then that permit comes to us through the building department. We issue um, expired permit violations on behalf of five jurisdictions, Pinellas County being one of them. And there is a $300 violation for not closing out your permit properly. And the second part of that is that you are required then to go close out the permit, which then generates revenue for the building department and gets the, the work inspected and resolved. Um, our revenues in the past year were impacted by um, the fact that ex building permits did not expire during the COVID um, uh, period, um, but all of the building departments are now getting back into and taking care of those expired permits 
but we also, that's also some of the reasons for looking at the ways we can most efficiently run the department and, you know, try to increase um, the way in which we coordinate um, the application of services versus, you know, the way we've traditionally done it, so. Commissioner Eggers. Michelle, thank you. Um, really appreciated when we had the opportunity to speak down at your office. Um, and it, obviously this set off alarm buttons for me because you're talking about uh, people's livelihoods being mm -hmm. affected possibly. And at the end of the day also, our residents may be hiring people to do work that aren't, lice, or that aren't uh, insured. So, you know, those are two issues I think we need to be at least aware of, um, at least letting people know that there's maybe a category of in, uh, contractors that you yourself are going to have to check on that. Uh, Absolutely. On that it does put the onus on, on consumers, on yeah. citizens yeah. to... So, so both aspects concern me a little bit. Uh, just to make sure I'm clear, 90% of the, of the contractors will still go through the same process that we are now. That's correct. Okay. So they're going to be insured. They're going to still get licensed. We're going to make sure that they have all the appropriate licenses and that kind of thing. So we're talking about these 1,400, less a certain number that, as you said, can get the license at the state level. Right. Um, the forecast is that approximately 550 of those 1,400 are those who will be yeah. Impacted. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the shortage of contractors because that really is a concern that we're having. I mean, I'm just, I was talking to a chief this morning about a fire station that they're talking about building. And when they first started talking about it, it was about $300 a square foot. Right. And now it's going to be $600 a square foot for the construction of their building. Now, they may have to put it on hold and wait till prices come down. It's about availability of talent and the raw product availability, Materials. so it's both, um, mm -hmm. both issues. But so it's, it's alarming to, to think that we might be putting certain people out of work um, at a time when, I mean, for them themselves bad, but also for the fact that we don't, we need more contractors. We need more contractors. So uh, that does concern me. Um, to, the, to the areas that uh, we're talking about, and you all are reviewing um, what might be needed. So they come in, these folks that are no longer licensed, come in for a permit. Are there some of those areas that we're continuing to explore that may not, re that we're saying don't require a permit, but you still must come in, in lieu of getting that permit, you still must come in and show us that you're licensed and, or not licensed, but that you still have insurance? Is there a way that we can still do that? Minimal check. So in lieu of a permit. So what I'd like to do is kind of uh, separate the question. Um, there is there are some contractors who do not require building permits, but do require other types of permits. For example, um, a, um, a driveway contractor may not require a permit to do the work under the Florida Building Code. They don't require a building permit, but they may still require a right-of-way permit or a zoning clearance or um, a habitat permit, you know, if it's impacting trees. Right. Those do not require licenses. So a contractor who has that residential um, driveway business will still be able to do their work. Um, so that addresses a certain portion of your question. The second part of it is, let's talk about that drywall contractor, for example, where you don't need a drywall permit in um, unincorporated Pinellas County, but you do in St. Pete Beach. That's what we hope to facilitate, foster those conversations to say, what is their interpretation of the Florida Building Code that, that is making them um, interpret that they require a building permit to do that work. Yeah. And so we're hoping that by um, having already identified where the discrepancies are, that we can help to, maybe the word is negotiate or, you know, help to um, eliminate, find some standardization in the interpretations and, you know, especially where there is no life safety issue. Yeah, I mean, think but, about like fencing that you mentioned yeah. that for some reason cities feel that they need to, whether they want to or whether they think it's dictated by the state building code, and we don't require that, at least if it's six foot. That's eight correct. Foot, eight foot we do. Exactly. Uh, so I think there, there will be some opportunities where we can eliminate that uh, permit requirement. And, uh, but and I think to I, your point. I also think that 
taking this a step further, we really need to look at whether or not we need all those different licensings in place or inspections. Mm -hmm. So let's take fencing. I, I went through this before and we had less than 5%, uh, 2% or 3% of all inspections. A person comes out, they say, I'm gonna put, you know, here's my lot lines, I've got it marked, I'm gonna put it here. Well, what happens if you go out and inspect and they put it in the wrong spot? Well, then you make them move it. Well. Do we really need to go out and inspect that when 2% of the of them actually fail? Or if the neighbor complains, then you go out and inspect and make them move it. Or do we need to inspect every single one? So I, that's the round table that I think we'll have those discussions about those different areas. Because that would, if we can free up building inspectors, we all know that we, it, we're having trouble um, hiring enough building inspectors, getting out to, to contractors in a timely manner. Maybe there's some things that we, no longer need to do that'll make our whole operating department more efficient. But that's the round table discussions about that to kind of go through those and see if we can get consistency yeah. and make a determination. Yeah. Now, and I wanted to say to that point, I, that's a great idea. I'm really excited that you're gonna be doing that. I was just talking to a contractor again this morning. He said, it's so frustrating to go around this county and do work because ev there's, well, he said 40, different organizations, you pointed out 17. I said it was, well, there's no more than 24 cities in right. the county's the 25th, <laughs> but certainly there's a lot of them and they have to go sometimes to one place for a fire uh, uh, code issues and some place to, you know, same, go to a building department. So it's really confusing to the extent that we can do any of that. I, I, don't, I think that's a mountain to climb, but at least some of that will be an, an improvement. So kudos to you. And if we can extend the time to the 20, to 2023 that allows our folks to continue making a living and allows our, our, our residents to continue being protected, I'm all for it. So Thank you, for I me, appreciate that. From my that. perspective, and I, I just think that's something. I think the option of giving your contractors, your license to a general contractor is probably 0%. I've talked to a number of contractors and they say, it's tough enough to keep control of my own people right. under my license because I have responsibilities. There is no way I'm going to give it to somebody else. So, That's I mean, one of the good guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other guys <laughs> yeah. are happy to anyway, sell to make their some license, money. right? Uh, yeah, I get it. So, but we have to consider all of those. So mm -hmm. anything we can do to help out, anything we can do to minimize permit requirements, um, I think continues to extend people's livelihoods. Um, but the, uh, the unknown piece to all of that is still this insurance thing. So I'm, I'm still concerned about folks that go on to people's homes and they are uninsured. And if something happens to them, I'm mean, talking about these 10%, yeah. you know, the 10 or 11% or less, maybe 500 out of the 1400, right. um, that our residents, we need to make sure that it's buyer beware. We are not checking on insurance. You need to do that. And I think that there are, I mean, that is part of our communication strategy is to work with communications to to spread that word about, you know, here's where licenses are required. And in all of these other trades, make sure that you check their qualifications, check their references, ask specifically to see evidence of their workers' compensation insurance, ask to see evidence of their general liability insurance, and that we do that to educate consumers yeah. to help themselves. I also had been consulting too with um, uh, Doug Templeton of Consumer Protection because they have a vested interest as well. We are often frequently, um, when we get a complaint about a contractor um, and and about the workmanship or the 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 character of a contractor, that's where we have authority. But consumer protection gets that same complaint because the contractor took off with the homeowner's money and didn't perform the work. So we often share information and resources and part of um, the story that we need to tell is that um, consumer protection includes an aspect of protecting yourself. Yeah. And when things go really wrong, if they're not licensed, then you know yeah. you do have yeah. and that as an option. My last comment was going to be towards that, which is the fact that we currently, if I'm not mistaken, through the licensing process, we check for felony we do. issues. So that if you have a contractor coming out to your house doing work in your house, in your home, um, you at least know that there's been a check, a background check, and that they don't have a felony. Um, so you have a felony, you don't have a felony, and you're insured, 
and at least you have that minimum level, then as you say, even then you try to get references and recommendations. Right. But I do think that's another element that at least it's gonna be buyer beware kind of things. But anyway, if we can extend the time, try to reduce the permit areas, but making sure somehow that we t try to check on the insurance and then let our residents know what the change is and it's coming, I think will be critical pieces of all this. So, but thank you for, for bringing this to my to my attention. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it too. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I think most of my questions have been answered. Um, one of my questions was how do we sustain it monetarily if we don't, if we're not charging licensing fees, but it sounds like we're already talking about that. But um, do we see any possibility that this could change in this session? Is there any support from like state contractors associations or anything? I haven't seen any any specific evidence. Um, but a lot can happen between now right. and July of 2023. Um, and um, and I, I have heard rumors, but I have not I've not seen anybody or I'm not aware of anybody stepping up to challenge um, the existing legislation. But Brian's on top of that. Yes, of course. <laughs> Together we are. Well, yeah. Okay. Commissioner Seal. I'm just curious, um, who pushed the legislation? As I understand it, um, it was driven by two factors. The first is there is a very strong lobby of general contractors um, who want to keep a larger piece of the pie. And um, uh, so that is that is one aspect that I have been told has is, is been an influencing factor. Um, another is that I think that there was some misinformation that was sold to the legislators about what the purpose of this legislation was. Um, if you look at the language of the legislation, it is actually called um, uh, to the preemption of local occupational licensing. Now, as I understand it, and this precedes my history with Pinellas County, but as I understand it, there was at one time a series of occupational licenses that were issued by each of the municipalities. Pinellas County actually has a dedicated occupational license page on our county website that specifically addresses that and says, in Pinellas County, you do not need an occupational license. You may need a construction trade license, which is different, um, but check with your local municipality. But the one thing that we do know is that those occupational licenses that were issued by or required by each of the municipalities, as I understand it, they were renamed into business tax receipts. And if you want to do business in Clearwater, you have to go get a business tax receipt to register your business in, in Clearwater. Now that's regardless of whether you need a license or not. And that the burden, I think it was addressing what you had said, Commissioner Eggers, about having to go to 40 different places to get all the permits and, and approvals that you need to do business. I think that that was conflated with the actual tr construction trade license that is skills-based, right? You don't need a skills test to be a pressure washer, although there are risks involved with pressure washing. But if you want to pressure wash in Largo, you have to go get a business tax receipt. You don't need a license, but you need a business tax receipt. And you have to go to St. Pete Beach, and you have to go to Pinellas Park. If you are a um, a garage door contractor and you want to install garage doors in Clearwater, you have to get a business tax receipt. You're licensed by the PCCLB countywide, but you know each municipality has their own requirement. And I think that that's what started some of this, uh, the, mo the motivation and the argument for the elimination of the licenses, but it, the, the water got very muddy. And I personally watched a lot of the debates and um, there was a lot of misinformation and a lot of false information that was presented as data. Um, you should have heard me, I was screaming at my computer monitor going, that's not true, you're wrong. <laughs> but nobody could hear me, but. To, to go back real quick to that business tax receipt, if, if my business, my garage door business is located in Largo, but I work in all 24 cities. I just need that 
one receipt in the city that I'm operating out of, or as I I'm understand doing it, you need it for each jurisdiction that you are working in. Okay, Commissioner Eggers, you had one more. Yeah, just a couple things, real quick. Um, first of all, it would be my goal that you continue tracking those 1,400 licenses. It sounds like we're down to 500 uh, that that we have a concern for. Right. And. The goal would be to make that zero. So somehow that we continue working over the next year or two so that these folks don't have to retire. They're not going to be able to go GC, so they're going to be out of work. Right. And that's absolutely not what the intention, I'm sure, of the state was. I'm it wasn't sure to put well. people out of work. It was like our pile was, driving it, experience. Yeah, yeah, it was probably to try to do less government intervention mm -hmm. stuff. And I get that. I understand. It also seems to me that there's only two or three counties in the state that have this kind of thing that we have, this, that this special true. act. So you're not going to have a, a rush of counties going up to, to Tallahassee for change. And I want to commend Brian. Last year was leading the effort on getting those words to our legislative delegation. Hey, exempt us folks that have special act. It's not to put onus on these folks, but it's really to make sure that that they're properly insured and our, our residents are properly protected. So, I mean, I, I, you know, you guys did a great job because it's just a couple of counties that have that. I don't see that changing. Brian, you might share something differently on that. But if, if there is any, you know, ch hope for change, I'm sure we would, would do that. But I think we're pretty much stuck with this and it's just a matter of how we go about making them able to still do work in this county. Agreed. And so keep, we'll keep looking at that number. Hopefully it'll keep dropping down as we will go over the next two years, at least. Thank you. I, I had one, one specific question on, you would keep talking about the garage door, and I pulled up the chart that you have on your website. Um, and so if they have a garage door specialty, uh, which was established about 30 years ago, um, now they need a general building residential specialty structure contractor license. What, what's the difference? So it, let's say I've been doing garage doors, and that's, you know, what now do I have to do? What kind of education classes, testing, will I have to do if I wanted to comply with the new state law? Well, the, the testing and the experience that you're required to get from garage doors locally to residential is very high. That's a very high gap. But to get from our garage door specialty to the state structural specialty contractor, which is the one that's that fourth one that you mentioned there, that is not an enormous leap. And many of our local contractors may qualify for that grandfathering into that classification. That was specifically one of the ones that I, I had mentioned. Um, now they may, if their license is not recognized because um, the structural specialty classification includes a much broader range. It includes hurricane doors, for example, that maybe the garage door specialty guy doesn't have that same expertise. Um, they, they may require testing and examination, but the gap is much smaller. And um, I think depending on the motivation of the contractor, some may choose to take that leap if, if it is required. Yeah, I, I, and I know it's, this has got to be some massive flow chart of if you're this, then mm -hmm. you're this, and, the, you know, I, and I get that. I'm just thinking about the guy who's been doing this one specialty, garage doors for 30 years, he's in his 50s, and now you're going to tell me I've got to take some classes or testing or whatever to get that next state license. And that's, that's a hurdle uh, in, in education. It's a hurdle financially, hurdle psychologically. Um, yeah. And I just, I, you know, and it's not showing that there's a dramatic need. There's not a problem we're solving or the state is trying to solve here on, on some of these specific issues. So that's, but. Um, and I hope that, what I'm hopeful is that some of this conversation is happening at the state level and that, um, you know, that kind of like with our pile driving experience, it was an unintended consequence and that the state can then take um, action to make it easier for these contractors to continue their work. Um, I, I have no predictions about it. I can tell you that we had a contractor come in, uh, I think it was end of, sometime in October. It was after his license had expired. And he was coming in and he was making his license good because he hadn't renewed before the expiration date. And 
He um, is, a, is a locally licensed specialty structure contractor. So he may be building um, uh, sheds, for example. And so he said to me, what am I going to do? And I said, well, you know, you can um, upgrade. You can, if you're qualified, you can grandfather to that state specialty. You can write your commissioner. You can call your local senator. You can, there are all these active ways that you can become engaged. And he, it was, I, I wanted to cry after my interaction with him because he said to me, he said, you know, my mother just died. He was probably 55, 60 years old. He'd been, he's just, he's the, the man that you're talking about. He was in front of me. He said, my mother's just died. My father just died. My wife and I just got separated. I'm finally getting ready to get back into business, and now they're going to take my license away. What am I supposed to do? And it was, it was, you know, I, I will do everything that I can to help you to get there. We're going to give you a letter of good standing. We're going to give you the shortcut link so that, you know, to get you to the application form. We're going to help you get there, but you're going to have to do this on your own. And he walked away, and my heart was broken because I can't fix that for him. You know, he's been, he's been working in Pinellas County. He's one of those good guys who, uh, you know, until these terrible things that happened in his life, um, had maintained his license compliant for all that time, and it was just it was heartbreaking. You know, these are the these are the stories. Yeah, we issue licenses, but really, it's about that hope and opportunity that is people's livelihoods. Commissioner Gerard, I just had a question about um, a specialty contractor's ability to contract with a general contractor to supervise that work that absolutely has to be done by a, or the permit has to be pulled. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that they can do or is there something that needs to happen in the statute for that? No, they can. They can create those partnerships and, and find someone to qualify their business. And let's just hope that it is, that it is for the right reasons, well, yeah. you know, that and it meets the... And that's what I'm the, wondering, if right. we need to change something to make sure We do not need legitimate. to do anything. Um, yeah. You know, for the for those guys who are the good guys who are doing it the right way, then, then we, of course, support them. Um, for somebody who's just selling off the, the right. right, I mean, that is a violation of construction licensing law. It's a $500 fine for a first infraction. Um, and, of course, um, contracting to an unlicensed subcontractor is also a violation of construction licensing law and is also eligible for a $500 fine, both to the guy who has accepted the, con the subcontract and the contractor who engaged him. Okay. <laughs> Just one last, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Edgar, <laughs> miss missing the microphone this year already. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I just hope that there's a way we can tie getting, you know, so somebody like we're talking about comes in to get a permit and they can't pull one technically. If it's not disallowed by the state, then maybe there's a way in exchange for the permit that you show something about insurance and you show something about, um, I don't know, background check status or something so that you say yeah we, we we're not going to require the permit you can do your work but do you have insurance and do you have this can we still do that is that still something we that is can't do that that was certainly one of the the areas that we explored with the county attorney's office is um is there a way that we can still register contractors um you know just to monitor their insurance we cannot do that um and the only reason that they would visit the building department is if the building permit is required. Um, and oh. if the building permit is required, then that contractor must be licensed and we perform that well, service on behalf of all of the building departments. But if it's required under state 
law versus mm -hmm. local. There's a two different things. So I didn't know if maybe not so in the yeah. Um, so we we did um, have quite a discussion with the whole group of our county attorney special specialists, and what it does come down to is if it is a requirement of the Florida Building Code that a building permit be right. issued. There's nothing you can do. There's about nothing we can right. do. But there are. But some in those interpretations, so perhaps what we don't know is and I don't want a single Clearwater out, but they require a permit. Is the permit because yeah. for aesthetic control reasons or is it because of their interpretation of the Florida right. Building Code? That's where we have the opportunity yeah. to influence those discussions. And, and those are the kinds of discussions that we would be having. Yeah, that round table will hopefully Exactly. That. Thank you for doing that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Anything further? Thank you very much for being with us this morning. We appreciate it and it's appreciate that you'll keep watching it. And Mr. Loak will keep watching and, and uh, as we move forward in the next couple of years. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, so may I take the, away the, um, the endorsement of the Board of County Commissioners to extend this. We make it effective uh, with the, the That doesn't state require mandate. an act of the commission. June 1st? Does okay. This doesn't require an act of the commission, so I don't think they need to act on that. I Very think you're good. looking for concurrence. And yes. Because I actually, I actually was looking to move it up until I found out how complicated this was. <laughs> and then I changed my tune after hearing hearing the difficulties associated with this. But Yeah, I think there's a lot of moving parts, and I think there is always slight hope that it, it could get tweaked uh, in Tallahassee. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you all. Mr. Administrator, uh, okay. next on our agenda is the agenda briefing. So I have two, two different things. Which one do you want first, COVID update or agenda brief? COVID. Okay, COVID. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, a lot has changed um, very quickly, um, as you know. Um, the, and, you know, we met our executive policy team, we met yesterday, and we discussed kind of the, uh, the new stage that we're in. And obviously, COVID is running rampant. Um, prior, you know, um, couple, uh, about a week and a half ago, um, we authorized to stand up our Largo site again. If you recall back um, in the fall, it was being handled by the private sector for testing, and so we shut down the site. The one thing we did, though, was we kept the building, and we kept paying the rent because of our concern um, of having <laughs> just what we're facing and stress on our uh, private providers to be able to do testing. So we stood that site back up. It's run by C.D. Ryan McGuire. Um, we're paying the rent and stuff, but they're running it and they're billing um, federal government and insurance and things. So um, from that standpoint, that's the only cost to us is our infrastructure. Um, but that site is up and running. Between there and Saint, um, the Healthy St. Pete, they're testing 1,000 people a day. Um, so it is very, very busy. And that includes, you know, but, you know, you're also going to Walgreens and, CVS and all the other, you know, private providers. So there's a lot of testing going on. Over the last seven day period, our uh, percent positivity is at 22.71%. Um, I will tell you, Dr. Cho told me yesterday that, that this week's gonna come out, it's gonna be over 30%. So it is a running rampant, but also um, that's not a surprise. We've heard that and we know that. It's very different than what we've seen. The CDC um, modified their guidelines, and, um, and we, we, if we haven't sent those out to you, we will, because we're going to be communicating with our employees about, you know, just trying to take preventative measures. It's not an issue. Um, obviously, the new variant is not something, unless you're unvaccinated, that is putting you in the hospital on a respirator. Um, but what it is doing is taking you out of the game. And it is the uh, spread of, the, uh, of this that is the concern. Um, we have significant issues operationally within Pinellas County um, in our, for instance, uh, the sheriff, you know, has a significant issue in the jail right now. And if staff is out, guess what? Then other staff have to cover those shifts. It's the same way um, in any type of, um, you know, essential function out there. It's taking, it's a staffing issue as much as it is managing, you know, the COVID itself. And that's what's happening in the hospitals. Our hospitals are not overly stressed at this point. Um, that could change. It's primarily having staff available. We did um, at, at our, um, at Dr. Jameson issued, um, go, went back to our COVID procedures um, because we're having ambulance delays at the hospital. And so we implemented uh, revised procedures that we had in place last fall. We're working hand in hand with our hospitals um, to cut down on those delays because when a 
when a, when a drop off is delayed by more than 15 minutes, well then that takes that ambulance out of being able to respond to other calls. So that's beginning to back up some of the system um, and it's having an impact. Um, the nursing homes is uh, less severe at this point. We had our lessons learned from isolating and how to do proper care. Um, and so for the most part, except with a few instances, uh, they're being able to manage those in place um, and not have uh, calls for people to be uh, taken out of the nursing home. Um, the schools, um, if you read about that, they set up uh, another testing site uh, for, their, uh, for the teachers, for the students and their families. Uh, so that again will help with getting um, tests available for people. Um, and the monoclonal site is still open until January 31st, we're, but we're encouraging people to check the website. Uh, that is obviously state run and state controlled and, and so that uh, it, it's scheduled to end on January 31st. It, it, that'll be up to the state whether they continue that or not. Um, the booster is very effective, um, but the main thing we're doing within Pinellas County is, is really going back to sign up kind of our modified procedures. We know that, um, that if you, uh, it, to the extent we can have barriers, to the extent people can wear masks, and things that we can do to try to prevent the spread as much as possible. We still have to continue operations, and so we're posting the CDC guidelines, uh, which you know does significantly change um, the way in which we manage this. So the CDC guidelines, if you test positive, stay home for five days. If you have no symptoms, um, after five days, you can leave the house, continue to wear a mask for an additional five days. That is the CDC guideline. If you were exposed to someone, um, but you have been vaccinated, uh, will then wear a mask for uh, another uh, 10 days and a test on day five. Um, so there's some modified procedures uh, that we're gonna continue to push out and um, try to keep our staff, staff safe. It's really a staffing issue, um, but it's, it is having an operational impact. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Commissioner Eggers? It'd be nice to, when we have the discussion, just to make sure, because you know, things that we hear, and none of us are medical in the medical fields, but that this particular variant is not really a, 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 a lung-based, it's more um, throat and, and upper body. I'd just like to know more about that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily asking for, you know, answers here, but I mean, to the extent that lung issues and you know being able to breathe obviously created a lot of the problems in the past this is a little different from what i'm hearing and understanding so maybe if you can see if our doctors can give us a, an update on that just uh, because i think you know the, the idea that it's spreading so fast is it's but the effects and is is a different story so i just want to make sure we understand Correct. the two mm -hmm. pieces together so i'll get you some more information Thank you. from our doctors and then the, the question I had was, uh, I think it was Mayor Demings from or uh, Orange County reported that in their hospitals in, in Orange County, it was like 90 something percent of the patients that were hospitalized were unvaccinated. Uh, Mayor Gelber reported that in Miami-Dade, 70 per percent of the hospitalization was unvaccinated. But we never seem to be able to get that kind of breakdown for Pinellas hospitals. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that here, but I will by Tuesday. I, I, I want to be able to provide that type of information. Um, but I have no doubt that we're going to see similar, um, you know, um, statistics. Okay. But on, on that point, I do think that, you know, there are some, some of the issues that have come up that, 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 that such a, in some cases, for people that are vaccinated, it's the my, it's so minor that some people are even asymptomatic. Yes. But some of those vaccinated people are getting it too. So I just don't, it's not like singling out unvaccinated. It's just it's about vaccinated getting it, maybe less in a milder yes, form. Um, and I think you know just just again being aware of all of that. I think part of the discussion is important. And we're we're looking at how we kind of continue to operate it's kind of a you know a new era of, of these outbreaks and you know and and how do we deal with this a little bit different than we you know did before and we're looking at in, internally because uh, we've been at this a long time and you know and staff have you know they got COVID uh, they had to take time off now they get an outbreak you know there's there's no rhyme or reason you know necessarily for that um, but it, it has an impact on them and their families and especially their paycheck if they are out of time. And so 
we have some internal things that we're working on uh, to work with our employees to get through this. Any other questions? All right, moving on. Okay, on to the agenda. Um, we have uh, some presentations and awards. One, two, and three uh, on our public hearings. Uh, the first public hearing is a recommendation to continue the matter. This is the um, alley and uh, that we had the long discussion on. Um, we did meet with uh, Safety Harbor, and then I met with the applicant. Um, there, the the, the north-south piece, the um, ten-foot right-of-way. Nobody has an issue with the um, vacation of that piece. The 50-foot right-of-way th to vacate that, um, however, is much more complicated. And we actually think there's a way for them to accomplish that without a vacation, and, and that creates a lot of other issues. Um, we've been unable to, uh, we, we met with them once. They agreed to meet with us and with Safety Harbor to go through some of those issues because, in fact, there's some fire department regulations that may increase their cost of construction um, that they wouldn't necessarily have to do. Um, so we want that opportunity to meet, but they were unavailable during the holidays, um, the, the applicant was. And so we're gonna request that we uh, continue uh, the 50-foot alleyway piece um, until we can have that meeting, okay? Uh, Barry, they, they do have representation now, you said, I think. Uh, yes, so they, they hired Brian, and um, it, and he was not familiar when we met. He was not familiar with the background and details, and so he was looking forward to getting into some more okay. of those details, and I think that'll serve all the parties very well. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, cons uh, item 6-7, um, items of the circuit uh, court. Um, re then we have re uh, reports received for filings. Then we have miscellaneous items received for filings. Any questions on any of those? Item number 18 is declaring surplus and authorizing sale of county owned equipment, uh, equipment vehicles on the attached list. Item 19 is award of a bid to Joe Payne uh, for construction inspection services for code enforcement. Again, this goes back, this is something that we've done. We wanna continue this. It's on an as needed basis. However, uh, you know, this is uh, to do residential and commercial construction plans. And that's probably one of the biggest areas that we're having is in the review of the plans. Um, but it also provides inspection services where we have the um, staffing issues and, and to keep the workflow going. Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, are they our um, current provider? Tom? Yes. No, I'm looking and did the their staff. price I go up? So. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. That's the reason I'm asking staff. Yeah. Just, just, just a little bit, Commissioner. I don't have the exact amount, but it did go up slightly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And have, well, Joe, while you're here, um, have we had any complaints about them? No, as far as I know, Joe Payne is a very good contract. We've used them for the last five, five years, in fact. Okay. They've really come through. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Item 20 is ranking of firms with Miles Partnership. This is for CBB for digital marketing. Um, this, this is up slightly. That was approved as part of the decision packages in this year and for the 22 budget. Yep. Barry, can we just maybe have a small presentation on, mm -hmm. on that one and on 21? If you could, on not today. On, on Tuesday, just a brief presentation on both of those. Sure. Okay. Um, Della will mark that down and we'll make sure we do that. 20 and 21, Della. And I think Miles has had the contract, I believe, longer than 2017. I think they've been with us for they've, many, they've, many years. They have. Um, but yeah, we'll have, we'll have CBB outline um, okay. what they're doing with that and where they're taking that. And I guess I was just curious um, in the background information, and you can answer this on Tuesday, is it looks like they just did a written evaluation rather than, um, it says written evaluation on September 29th of 2021. It's just a huge contract. So. It, it is a huge contract, but, uh, and you know, I know that uh, that's the reason, I know they come, they were looking to push more. They were, they were taking some things out and pushing more to digital. Um, and so there was a shifting of some of the cost, mm -hmm. but they were also doing more with digital. And that's the reason of, of the increased uh, amount. Because it was about five million before, and now it's a little over six million a year. And uh, that um, it is kind of the, the price increase that you're looking at. But part of that was 
not doing some other things that they used to provide non-digitally. Yeah, I think the question would be about how much we're paying them for, for producing the material and how much we're paying for airtime, for lack of a better, you know. So what, what percentage are we paying for Web designing hosting. the ad and what for, are we for the buying of the space on whatever okay. format that we're buying it on? We'll have a presentation for Tuesday. Thank you. Item number 21 is ratification of the um, US e, uh, EDA uh, grant for $3.8 million uh, for the Innovation Center. We knew this was coming. This is the action to, that allows for that. 22 is an award of a bid to Shoreline Foundation for the replacement of Fort DeSoto Bay Pier. And just a, a point on this one, um, and, and I, I'm working with our county attorney's <laughs> office about the, if this was, and not saying for this project because of the timeline, obviously, but if this is the type of project that is a improvement to a beach park, county owned beach park, that would be eligible under state law for TDC funds. And there's some question about peers and things that the attorney's office is looking at. But let's say it was, and then we obviously have our own plan that we have to work around as far as that. But, and it's just something for the commission to consider is that this is $3 million, $3.7 million of penny money, correct? And so if we were eligible to use TDC funds for that, doesn't take a change to state law, doesn't take a long process of going through the whole plan, but it's $3.7 million when we've, we're gonna have 13 million at the end of this year, 30 million at the end of next year that we don't have encumbered yet, that then we could take in the penny and slide over to some non-TDC fund that would be an infrastructure that we've been talking about for years as far as we need more money over here and we can't spend it this over here. Anyway, it's just something I want you to think about because I'm gonna be talking about that a lot with the TDC this year and, and uh, seeing what we can bring forward. So just wanna make that point where we're on that agenda item. Item 23 is ranking of firms for professional engineering services pertaining to Brownfield Environmental Assessment and Restoration and Remediation Services. Uh, these contractors perform a variety of work, um, brownfield work, um, some asbestos investigation and remediation when necessary. Item 24 is ranking of firms with Phillips North America uh, for uh, the defibrillators uh, for safety and emergency services. Onto the regular agenda, item 25 is purchase authorization for heavy and light duty vehicles. This is really the heavy duty uh, vehicle piece of that um, that was not uh, ready when we pr did all the light duty vehicles and stuff at the last meeting. Item 26 is a Florida jo uh, job growth grant um, fund application. Uh, this grant application uh, is for the PIE to request 10 million in state funds um, and that has a county match. I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal. I just had a question on this is um, if we have a dollar value of what the land's worth at this point and whether we could sell it. For all of ARCA? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll ask that question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's a big parcel of land and might be worth more than us putting more money in it. Erica. I'll ask the question. I don't know the answer. Um, item 27 is resolution approving an affordable housing advisory committee report uh, to the state housing uh, initiatives partnership. Uh, this is a uh, requirement and uh, the advisory committee makes the recommendation uh, to you for approval. This is something you appointed many years ago. Item number 28 is a resolution assigning review of request to reduce state um, distance requirements for medical marijuana treatment facilities to the Pinellas County Board of Adjustment and Appeals. Um, Staff looked at this and thought that it, that was a better place for these types of uh, reviews to occur. Um, and we can provide a staff um, presentation on Tuesday to, to go through this de in more detail. Yeah, I think knowing what that actually means in a day-to-day -day is gonna be important. Correct, I thought that might be. <laughs> Commissioner Seal? 
And I guess the other question for Tuesday is, can we refuse to hear these at all? <laughs> I, pro I have staff available on Tuesday. Um, item number 29 is a grant award for, from the U.S. Department of Justice um, uh, for the Forensic Lab. $288,000 is no match requirement. Item 30 is a resolution approving the American Rescue Plan uh, spending plan. And before we went through and we, over the November and December, we kind of outlined the different projects. Well, now we have to come up with the spending plan. There's been some adjustments to that. Um, and so we've, we've outlined those and what's in the first phase and they've broken that down between the spending plan and the, um, the, the, let me get the right wording here. Potential. The what? Potential project. And the potential project. So you had tranche one, tranche two, now they've I defined it as spending plan and potential projects. These, these are always gonna shift because remember there's a timeline associated with this so some of the items they've moved up because of concerns of whether they'd be able to get the projects done in a timely manner uh, within that time period and so sometimes it's just a shifting of projects but again we're going to review these annually we're going to come back quarterly and present those to the commission on where we're at um, and continue to refine that as we go along when do you anticipate us talking about the uh, nonprofit section well, we have that, that is within the plan, okay? So we can, we can discuss that whenever you want. We can discuss it on Tuesday. Um, the, the idea is that we, we set up this, the nonprofit piece um, and then we're gonna have to have a process to evaluate those, those types of applications. And the way we broke that down is to do something first um, and, and then kind of do a lessons learned from the what type of projects we got in um, and then we can make adjustments whether we want to do that on the second um, round or not. Which which attachment on the uh, Granicus is goes through the nonprofit section? Because I was reading through it and I did not see that pulled out. Do you know, Chris? I mean, it's it's it was in the you know 18 million, but I'm, I'm talking more about if we had talked about the process for how we were going to allocate that 18 million. Yeah. The the project itself is in, just as you say, the process is not lined out in the plan. We are working with uh, with all the nonprofits. We're actually polling them right now to see what they're thinking. We don't have that information back yet. Okay. That's where I was, yeah, I, that's where I was going for the next layer of the conversation of when we would be doing that. Commissioner Gerard? First, when you say all the nonprofits, what does that mean? It's a good question. Uh, it, <laughs> It was about 700, so I, oh. all is a strong word, but it, it was a lot, good. yes. All right. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers? <laughs> Microphone. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the, the, the nonprofit, so that's good. Um, I noticed that there's a piece about the, the CAM, our, our coordinated access model. There's a piece yeah. about uh, Sheriff's Mental Health Squad. Um, there's a piece about, well, no, the, the other question was, um, I'm meeting with a chief this afternoon. I'm not sure what the topic is going to be the issue, but there was an article in the last couple, three weeks that came out that talked about first responders having a lot of, of I guess, emotional issues that they're dealing with because of the last year or two, uh, whether it's the paramedics, whether it's police, whether it's firefighters. I think it was specifically talking about firefighters. Um, I don't. I don't know who's thinking along those lines, if there's an avenue or some money set aside that we can augment or help that process. Um, again, there may be parts that are being, that they're each dealing with. Uh, I just wanted to collectively see if there's something that we might be able to help out on through these funds, even if it's on a temporary basis. So we, we did consider a lot of different requests and, and uh, certainly fire uh, departments were one of those. We, we opted not. Um, that that's not part of our recommendations um, and that because those are operational issues day to day and I think that they need to incorporate those within their operating budgets. Um, yeah, so, so for instance, like on the mental health side of the sheriff's office, it's really a funding issue. We're using some of these funds, but we've earmarked and set aside dollars to where we can continue those programs in the future. So we didn't do anything that was a short-term type operational thing. We were trying to go to capital. 
but on a couple of those, we're not funding the program that way. We're funding it out of the general fund, the sheriff's mental health squad, okay? But, but we're using these dollars to start up the program. And then we have set aside capacity to keep continue that on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and, um, I, and I, I get that. But this, the, the, what's happened the last two years and what, we've been, what those folks have been going through, those aren't normal operating procedures. So that's why I was asking the question. And it wouldn't be necessary. It's kind of a, and I don't know the term, so I'm just throwing the terms that, you know, PTSD or whatever they've gone through and what they're dealing with. So as long as they're getting the help that they need and we don't think that there's a short-term role for us, fine. But I just want to make sure that we're, we've at least looked at that and, and make sure that we are getting the care or at least I, to the extent that we can help. I, I don't know what the individual needs are. We didn't open it up to all the fire departments because some are municipal, some are um, independent fire districts. It, it, the municipalities get their own funding, so you know we um, we didn't open it up because the, when we opened the door, it, there's so many needs and so many different types of requests, and from a management standpoint, it was very difficult. Well, so. I think to, you just said it, Barry, that, that those some of those places are within cities and they have their own ARPA funds. We there are some of these fire departments that were, are within the unincorporated, yeah. and maybe we should look at them a little differently. That's they, all I'm saying. Yeah. I know that they're all independent, quote, independent groups, but they they're do, still and they have within. their own operating funds. And so from like a standpoint of the sheriff's office, we're taking care of the sheriff's mental health needs um, or, or those yeah. types of issues operationally. Um, when we open it up to to say, you know, what other needs are out there, that's a that's a pretty wide door. And it's very hard to manage and report that. And so, you know, that, again, I'm not saying that the need isn't there. I just think that, you know, the ARPA funds isn't the best way to address those. Okay, well, we might respectfully disagree on that because I think this, these ARPA funds are based pr a lot of things that we've gone through the last two years. There's other things, too, and I just think we got to make sure that, you know, if, even if it's the areas that don't get that funding from cities, um, and again, I don't know what the gentleman, what we're going to talk about today, but um, I'll let you know what I find out. But, okay. Yeah, so thank We're you. happy to talk individually about any of these. Thank you. And it would also be for organizations to come to us. Um, if they, they have a need as well, you know, mm -hmm. to initiate yeah. that, yep. that request as well. Yep. But uh, 700 nonprofits, um, I'm surprised I haven't gotten more emails. That and, and that's, that, that, is yeah, the, so. that is the difficulty. It's, it, it, there's so many different types of operational needs. And the, the biggest concern with the ARPA funds is the reporting requirement too, because it's not just that you have to do that. You have to have the, the infrastructure to get the reporting, the um, uh, and all that that work done um, and reported back through the federal government in the way in which the act requires, um, so it becomes very very difficult. And when you open this up uh, administratively to manage it, um, item 31 is a change order to Keystone Contractors uh, for Lakeshore Estates. Um, I'm going to ask Jill to come up and talk about this. This is a very complicated project. Um, and we ran into a lot of bad soils and other things. Um, and so I'll just ask her to cover this project in more detail. Good morning, everyone. Jill Silverboard. Thank you, Barry. So this change order relates to phase two of our Lakeshore Estates projects. We've completed phase one and what we may refer to as sort of a phase A, uh, 1A, excuse me. We had to remove one street from the original phase one project. Uh, we had a lot of performance issues. Y'all might remember you approved a change order for that one as well. Um, I actually have a, a map that's not in your backup. If they can just pop it up there, maybe it'll help. So um, phase one are those in yellow that you see. Um, the yellow that that's the cursor's on right now, that's the street that, um, that got removed. Uh, phase two is in green. Uh, you see a couple of those fingers. And then um, phase three is in orange, which is currently under construction now. And then phase four. Phase three and four are attached, um, obviously, to the overall project, but but are not part of this change order contract. So phase two um, is requiring a change order because we discovered some 
really interesting conditions underneath all of these roadways. These roadways were not built by the county. This was a private um, development, and we, um, at some point in the past, took over maintenance responsibility, inherited, inherited them, and this is our first project to um, try to go in and, and correct uh, roadway conditions and drainage. Because at the time this was built, drainage obviously wasn't the same um, significance that it is today uh, in terms of our uh, properties, particularly on fingers like this. So the change order actually does two things. Um, it It is going to address the corrections that are required to fix what we found underneath the roadways. I mean, we found entire cypress trees uh, when we when we pulled up um, the existing roadways. The original contract anticipated that there was a shell base that we could simply reuse, um, and so that's not going to be true. We're going to now have to use gravel, and we've had to completely redesign how we're going to reconstruct these roadways at those locations where uh, there's just voids. I mean, the good news is, is they were cypress, so the tree was still there. Um, you know, had it been some other type of tree that had deteriorated, you would have had, uh, you know, uh, sinkholes uh, in the roadway or, or drops in the roadway in the past. So that is that is a big part of the change order. We've got a change now, uh, and we're deducting the, the shell, and we're adding the gravel. There's also a great deal of utility work that has been done um, out here. I'll start with water and sewer because it's the easiest, but our pre-construction uh, inspections revealed some additional work to line some of the existing septic sewer lines. Um, we also found that the water lines were only about four inches below, I think it was about four inches below the, the pavement. So we've had to go in and add shock um, uh, absorbers between uh, those, some of those areas, and then in some of the areas we had to correct the um, alignment of the water mains for fire protection purposes. So there is a fire protection component that's being addressed as part of uh, Lakeshore Estates Phase 2 as well. Um, so the, the, the complaint that um, we've had uh, relative to this project that I want to try to get to really quickly, and I, you know, I apologize for the yellow, green, orange, blue, that's all part of Phase 2. I was trying to identify um, which things we'd already finished. So yellow's done, um, green is done, and then orange is what we're working on now, and blue is um, yet to come. It's supposed to start uh, a little later this year. So um, phase one is actually completely, is, is a completely different set of roads in, in the neighborhood. So this, this all is phase two. The phases on the left really aren't phases as far as the contract is concerned. That, that's correct. Okay. As I wanted to make sure, I, I don't think I was clear about that, and so it probably gave you the idea that, that's a, that there are four phases to this project. Thank heavens there aren't. Well, There's Lake Shore Estates phase one that's completely finished, and then this, which has four sub-phases. Yeah, I was, when I first looked at it, I thought that it was done, and then we're having to go back after we were done. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but the part I was gonna share with you next that's, um, I think, a concern that you may have heard, some of you may have heard, is that we are replacing what is there with like, okay? So on the yellow fingers um, out there where, I don't know what the name of that one is, Canal or, hang on, I'll tell you. Lakeshore Drive North, and the remind, T. Please remind folks where this is exactly. I'm sorry, this is up in the Lake Tarpon area. Um, and the neighborhood, I think, is fairly well known by the name, but there are multiple Lakeshore Estates uh, areas. Yeah. So this is North County. So if you look at the T um, for Lakeshore Drive North and then the other area we completed in yellow out there, the original uh, construction included curb and gutter and piped drainage. There, the other portions, such as um, uh, Lakeshore Drive for the blue that we haven't gotten to yet, were not constructed that way. They were constructed with a swell system, culverted driveways, and a swell system. Um, this project was designed to replace like improvements with like improvements. So within the same neighborhood, some property owners have curb and gutter and others do not. However, uh, we are making significant improvements over what the current conditions are because 
this is the first time they've really been touched, you know, that we've had a big project. So I know on Lakeshore Drive, for example, um, you know, the, the swell areas will be regraded, resodded, all new culverts, um, driveway aprons, and uh, it's, you know, I, I think if you looked at the current conditions out there in the field, um, you know, I would hope that you could agree at whether the property owners um, agree with us or not, that's how we designed it. If you want to put all of the drainage in infrastructure underground, then that's going to be a lot more money and a completely separate project. We're not currently permitted to do that. This project is permitted to anticipate that the surface um, drainage systems that exist in portions of the neighborhood, as well as the new pipe drainage systems. Um, why that decision was made, I don't know, but I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you have. So Jill's actually taken two issues at once. Um, <laughs> so the first piece is the change order. The change order is a result of subsurface conditions. Um, my question is, okay, why didn't we know that, you know, when we did the core samples? Um, I'm sure your question too, uh, why didn't we anticipate this? They did core samples, um, but obviously not enough, and not in the right areas. They literally took core samples in one area and you found the base and the area that they didn't, there's trees. Um, and so I asked that same question, yeah. that is a construction management issue. We shouldn't have change orders like this and so we're addressing that internally. However, that's the conditions that we found. And, and Barry, in phase one, the original phase, did we have the same issue? Not exactly, but we did have issues. Okay. Uh, they weren't quite the Not severe. Not to the extent. And I, I, I didn't see the severe. pictures on this. I mean, you got entire roadways where there's just whole well, trees yeah, coming yeah, out of Which the makes you wondering about, like you were just saying, our testing. Why didn't we know that? How did we not see that, yep. um, anticipate the project? And we had to, you know, we had to show the administrator uh, where all the borings were taken because it was a, you know, it was a surprise to us and the contractor. You actually have some of the photographs in your backup for this item with the big cypress trees. We. We missed it. Um, as Barry mentioned, though, we actually are in a much better pre-construction QA, QC process that's been implemented um, since Barry joined the county, and hopefully that's going to serve us better so that we're not, we're not as surprised. We're, we're going to run into surprises. Um, but in this case, you know, this was not something that was reflected in the pre-construction uh, inspection yeah, so, work. So that's a change order. The other piece that she was discussing is really a result of a um, um, homeowner uh, complaining about having swales versus curb and gutter. Yeah. Um, that is the background. That's the reason it was designed to be replaced as as is. Um, if we eliminate the swales, then we have to address all the stormwater. And so there'll have to be an area. There'll have to be treatment, et cetera, and stuff. So it would be it would be starting the project over. Charlie. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, and I'm going to speak. I, I, your, your, your point on the first phase, and not it, it, we did have this issue in phase one, and you know I'm, I'm really disappointed. We obviously didn't find it, uh, do a better job of identifying at least in terms of understanding the real cost of this project, which yeah. is a project that never seems to end. You know, for these folks, I feel so bad for Correct. them and what they're going through. But the piece that I'm going to talk about is this this phase four that. North Shore Drive and the discussion that you're having about one homeowner having an issue. And I did go out this week, I did go out yesterday, and I uh, really wanted to thank uh, Rhonda Bowman for meeting me out there from staff uh, mm -hmm. to talk about it, to bring drawings, to show, talk to this one owner. But if you start at the western end, or the, yeah, the western end, which is the left side of the screen on that blue, and moving to the east, and I'll be glad to have this conversation with you, Barry, sure. when I'm one on one, but um, all of it is being taken care of uh, on the western end with light swales in the middle parts of it. Um, as you see that first, second, third vertical orange there, a pipe, actually they are putting pipe in the right of way um, and having a light swale over top of it. And that water will then drain north on that orange piece, that third orange from the left, it'll go north and it'll drain that way. The piece, that last blue piece to the east is a separate, so to speak, system. And um, it is a ditch, not a swale. Mm -hmm. And it is awful. I wouldn't want it in my front yard. You wouldn't want it in your front yard. And all I said, and of course, you know, this is staff decisions. They bring them to us and all that. But it is not a swale. Okay. Um, it is, I mean, it may be defined as one, but it is when you have your property, and I, I don't know what the drop is to the bottom of the ditch, it is dangerous. 
And okay. uh, there's going to be a little evening out of that. I, I'm understanding she showed some drawings how it will even out, but the drop to the bottom is going to be even deeper. Mm -hmm. um, a house across the street that has uh, probably a pipe that was put in by the owner, a previous owner or a previous owner, is going to be repiped. This house on this side of the street that didn't have somebody be so uh, <laughs> bold is not going to have a pipe put in. So you're going to have a, a home on the other side that actually looks pretty good and your home on this side that doesn't. And I, I know we're getting into the weeds here a little well, bit. Well, I have photographs well, if you want to see it. I've got pictures of exactly yeah, what you I, saw yesterday. I, I don't think for the, for the purposes of this item, we can certainly discuss yeah. the issue. Yeah, I would I like mean, to do I that. Think the, I, I think the issue mm -hmm. was really the change order. I didn't yeah, necessarily. The item is I mean, for the change order. The, the change order is on the air in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the orange. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Well, no, it's all, um, it's orange and blue. I mean, okay. it's, all of, it's all of the work that has not been completed, so it's the orange and blue. Okay, and um, and I, I don't disagree with you, Commissioner. The the what the residents have endured on this project is, is significant. Um, it's not the same as the, the the original phase and the types of issues that they're going with, but we've we spent a lot of time and we actually had one of the um, staff members that actually designed and helped us design our portfolio pro management process in um, recently, mm -hmm. and I didn't recognize her otherwise I would have pointed it out. But they've, they've really taken a lot of steps to try to improve our processes to make sure these, these types of things don't occur. Um, I don't think that that will ever be eliminated. I've done it before where we, I looked at, I literally looked at the core samples and we did all these core samples and then they get to an area that's completely wet and completely, you know, requires a change order. I think to make, we want to make sure that our procedures are tight. Um, obviously, you know, they weren't tight enough on this one or we wouldn't be facing a change order like this, but that is what we're uh, facing right now. Yeah. And, and, and again, on that piece, uh, there's some, uh, you know, the whole maintenance issue of these swales is, is, is concerning. I mean, I think there's a, a, a she was saying there's something about a 10 year uh, review of this, unless a resident calls in that there's a problem. But if you go, go like to the east of this gentleman's property that we're talking about, um, the, 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 the swale underneath a, prop, a, a driveway was completely closed. I mean, it wasn't like it needed some maintenance. It needed to be opened up. So the which, the, the which it will be as well, part no, of the project. I understand that, but I mean that's, the, that's but, why we're doing the project. But the, yeah, but the concern is is that we're not maintaining it. That should have been maintained along the way. We should have been looking at. And so the concern is if when we do this open ditch, and the maintenance going forward, are we going to have some of the same issues that we have now? Because the maintenance program is is tough for residents to grasp and understand and. When, mm -hmm. when will it be done and how will it be done? Obviously, it's not done often enough proactively. Right. It's more reactively. Um, so anyway, that's just, a, that's just that little piece that was in, in the drawings that I looked at that was purple. That's the only area that wasn't getting a minor swale or a pipe. And it's just got these ditches that will be a little bit rounded but still deep. And I just, and we'll talk about it. And I don't want to okay. talk about any yeah. more about that today. So yeah. Uh, yeah. We Again, we inherited what's there. The, the, only, the only reason I asked And we her, do have a process. I didn't want to go into great detail on that, but the only reason I brought it up is because you did receive a letter I saw yesterday uh, regarding the issue, so I wanted to make you aware that you know, we're aware of it we, and, and you know, we'll be discussing it more of it. And I think in, in not only in this neighborhood, but communities throughout Pinellas, we should be trying to get away from the ditch uh, yeah. as drainage. I agree. Commissioner Seal? I was going to... I can tell you places in Wilman that are very deep as well as in Seminole as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind just sending us that map plus also any pictures that you might have. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah and to your point, uh, it was interesting when I was out there, but one, another resident came along and, and talked about a permeable uh, pipe. So. It's a pipe you can put in that still has permeating abilities. So it's not that it just has to have grass there that permeates into the ground, which is part of the attraction of a ditch. But you have pipe in there that also allows it to move, but also permeate. So it's interesting. I didn't realize that they had that as an option, but interesting. Yeah. So who knew? We have we have a few pictures. We'll, we'll certainly send them around, but I, yeah. you can you can share those while we're you know here. But we'll we'll certainly send that out. All right. Moving on. Okay, um, item 32 is a fourth amendment to a contract with HDR Engineering for the San Martin or, um, over Riviera Bay um, Bridge Development Environmental Study. So this uh, contract's 
Item number 33 is resolution um, um, providing authority to expand the areas of use for golf carts for unincorporated Palm Harbor. I know this has been through extensive discussion and review. Item number 34 is um, approval of the Pinellas County Technical Rescue Team Agreement between the county and the cities of Lar uh, Clearwater, Largo, Pinellas Park, and St. Petersburg. Item number 35 is Amendment 2 uh, with Advanced Disposal Services for um, South, uh, Solid Waste Southeast, Inc. for landfill operations at uh, Bridgeway Acres. I'd, I plan to discuss this on Tuesday. And we're going to have staff available okay. for that. Um, item number 36 is appointments to the technical management committee. So we had a, a person leave, and so uh, the recommendation is Robert Mills out of Solid Waste to fill that vacancy. Item number 37 is a resolution approving issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds uh, for a multifamily residential housing unit for uh, Creekside Manor. And this is a, a current facility. We're purchasing it and rehabbing it. Is that Let me see. your understanding? Yes, the projects include the acquisition and rehab of uh, Kirkside Manors 1 and 2, um, a 92-unit senior rental housing complex located at Franklin Street in Clearwater, and 1335 Pierce Street in Clearwater. So two different groups. Um, they're two different units, phase 1 and phase 2. Um, but it's a rehab. I think it, it just goes to the, the question that when I read it, it pops up of, and I know that we've done this a couple of times where we've kind of, because some of these are so old, they need, I mean, Correct. it's basically uh, needs to be a, a complete fresh start. But my, my question would be about how many of these do we, and I, I, I don't know what the specific question I really have is, but it seems like how many are we buying an existing and rehabbing that doesn't create any real new units necessarily. And that's where I'm starting to wonder about it's it. preserving it's preserving units um, and, and, and I get and, I mean and these are federal tax credits um, so but to your point we can ask because um, I heard to kind of outline and give you kind of an overview because you get these one by one right and maybe we can get an overall report for Tuesday that would give you some sense of what we what we see over a year or five years or Perfect. something like that yeah. Perfect. So I'll ask Della to reach out and, and have that available for you on Tuesday um, item 38 resolution approving multifamily housing revenue bonds. Uh, this is for Clear Bay Terrace, uh, multifamily housing residential unit. Under item number 39, this is a proposed settlement. Uh, this is a confidential matter that I will reach out to each of you prior to Tuesday to discuss and answer any questions you may have. Uh, and currently I have nothing planned under item number 40. A question for Jewel. Right. Uh, Jewel, on the work that we did on the redistricting last month, is that the final step or does it still go up to the state for approval? The state does not approve the um, action that you take here locally on your county commission districts. The only um, subsequent follow-up action that occurs um, after you all take action are we will the, we are working with the clerk to ensure that we are meeting the advertising requirements and you will at some point probably I would guess maybe at your second meeting in January uh, see the um, confirmation of compliance with those advertising requirements placed into your minutes okay but there's no other additional action on our part and there's no other level of government that has to approve what we that is absolutely correct right, thank you Item 41 is county administrator's report. I'll have something for um, Tuesday. And then the commission has an appointment to the Palm Harbor Community Services Agency by Commissioner Justice. Item 43, county commission new business. Uh, I've been informed that uh, uh, mayor-elect, for another half hour, mayor-elect Welch will be appointing himself to serve as the city of St. Petersburg representative for the Tourist Development Council. We'll need to approve that on Tuesday. Um, so set aside another half hour for a discussion and debate on <laughs> if you want to do that. <laughs> Anybody else have anything else for new business for Tuesday that we don't have already? Not that I've thought of yet. Anything else, Mr. Administrator? All right. 
Thank you very much. We will see you Tuesday. We are adjourned.